particular uh, session is art in a time of upheaval. So uh, we want to spend the next hour and a half um, in a bit of a collective experiment in um, how we can really examine um, the process of intervention through creative practice and, and as well as the reflexive of that relationship is the, the uh, impact of um, social movements of cataclysmic events that happen in our communities and in our lives and how they affect our social our creative practice. And so the question of the impact on our creative practice and the impact of our creative practice on social movements and what that looks like and the forms of that shape that takes. Um, so the first thing that we wanted folks to do is to think about the, uh, a movement moment or a cataclysmic event or something that has really deeply impacted your artistic practice and to just help people get juices flowing we were just going to share some of ours and then we'll have the opportunity for folks to share with with a partner um, something so to just think of a moment that was critical in forming your artistic practice um, and it's hard to come up with one but like just something that came to mind for me um, so it's the, on the timeline, it comes in in the 1880s, was uh, Nellie Bly, who's a journalist. Um, and it kind of came out of our conversation today of really powerful women. That's women Nellie Bly. That's Nellie Bly. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nellie Bly is this amazing journalist. Um, <laughs> comes in and did amazing investigative reporting um, in, um, in Bellevue to try to sort of shed light on the issues for um, for people that were housed there, um, that were suffering from mental illness. So for me, that was like really impactful in terms of like making me want to, to shed light on things that I found unjust, that I got to learn about, and I did a little report when I was like in elementary school or something. But um, for me, her, like that moment was really important in terms of artistic practice um, to form my practice. So we're asking, yeah, we're asking folks to think about, um, and it could also be a, uh, a um, it could be a creative moment, or it could also be um, a large collective experience, like the I Have a Dream speech. Um, or, What's your moment, Michael? Oh, my moment personally? Yeah. My moment personally? Um, <laughs> um, uh, a particular moment for me that had a particular resonance was that the, the, um, the, the economic collapse of 2008. Um, we had been involved with um, issues around housing and land prior, but suddenly our work was given a different uh, resonance and people were like, oh, housing is a human right? Yeah, okay, maybe. Now that a, a growing segment of the population um, was affected in the same way 
um, that I had been affected personally and in the, you know, my working class uh, experience, right? And so that was a sort of profound moment in like my understanding of like language and how I express as a maker language to sort of like tell my particular story and how that story can have popular resonance in uh, relationship to the art that, art that I want to make. Um, a moment for me that stands out is, um, it's called the Battle of Seattle. And it was the shutdown of the World Trade Organization meeting in Seattle. Uh, I was actually a student at Ohio State in Columbus, Ohio, really far from Seattle. I was involved in uh, activism on campus and in the community. And we shut down like downtown Columbus. And this obviously happened, most people know this. This happened around the world actually. Like there was what happened in Seattle, but then there were the actions that took place all around the world. And the way it impacted my practice was that I had um, my sort of vision and perspective on change uh, was just really scaled up, just really blew up, and I started to uh, think a lot bigger about uh, what we could do and what we could win. Okay, oh, go, go, go. Yeah. Okay, so. Oh, oh, let me go. <laughs> So, um, in terms of the timeline, we're not going to get like in a little order? Okay. <laughs> uh, in terms of the timeline, um, I would say for me it was when I was a student at Hunter College in 1995. Um, there was the threat of, uh, well actually that came a little bit later, but there was the threat of raising tuition at that time, um, like of $2,000 more, which was really incredible for most folks. Um, and everybody had a sense that that was going to dramatically change the demographics of like who was able to go to uni and be the slow like chopping block to like open admissions, which meant um, the uh, the right that high school students had to go to CUNY as a college, um, regardless of their some of their scores and things like that, and their, and their academics, um, the right that they had in terms of being in public college, even though they still had to pay tuition to go there. Um, so. For me, uh, there were, you know, we, we organized a, a massive student strike that had like 20,000 people in, in uh, City Hall. And I was just, a, I was a poet coming out of high school knowing like how important poetry was. Um, but this kind of allowed me to work with other poets who were also activists and find a community with them. And it just uh, allowed us to use our, our personal stories um, and and like how can I say and connect that to some of the struggles we were dealing with within the movement um, and then within our own lives and like our, you know, our struggles around access personally but also our struggles within the movement itself as, as women as people as women of color etc so that was really cool. okay so um, so these moments are also like put in a context uh, in terms of the discussion that we've been having and in terms of like how art and activism dance with each other and how they merge them. At the, at the um, end of the, of the previous session, we were starting to talk a lot about the moment and certain moments and certain pivotal moments and transformational moments. And it seems to me that, and people were talking about that art and activism, you know, and community work were not really separate, uh, that the balance, all the questions of aesthetics and, and purpose are really can be linked. And I think for me, uh, throughout my life and also now, I'm looking at the intentionality of both arts and activism is to find that portal, to find that entrance place into the consciousness of a human being, into the consciousness of a community, into the consciousness of a society at, at large. Susan and I were talking about that sometimes you don't get to go through the front door. Sometimes there is a window that is open in the basement, in the little crack <laughs> that you get to throw, go through. And sometimes that window has actually been left open by on purpose, either consciously or unconsciously, by the person, by the organization, by the society that you want to go into. So you can find this portal, you know, and that both art and activism is trying to find the images, the ideas, the resonating idea that can get you through this portal. So they share that. And, and that the whole thing that, that wants to get through has a, has a feeling, another word that came up, of necessity that something's necessary. There's a great little sequence in Universe's uh, New Peace Party People where the Steve Sapp has this monologue that says, 
uh, Martin Luther King, necessary. Malcolm X, is necessary. The Black Panthers, necessary. So that whole thing about that, I, I thought that was really great that that thing about necessity came in. So when I was thinking about where I would place myself on this timeline, I thought, well, you know, the kind of thing that was really important, you know, for me was like 1979, put that here, uh, when I first went to the public theater in Joseph Pack, and I thought, well, that was necessary in my life, but was it really that kind of moment, that historical moment and whatever? And then I thought, well, there was a real thing when I fell into Occupy Wall Street and joined the Puppet Guild and the arts and culture uh, part of Occupy Wall Street, where it really was about um, finding images, the art that could serve the activism. The public theater was very much about activism in art, which was sort of like one of the discussions. And this was very much art and activism. And I thought, well, the necessity moment is actually right now when the you know, floor of my life has fallen out and I don't know how to pay my rent. And it's like, you know, what is, you know, my, you know, what am I going to do next? And I said, oh, the four mission thing that came up, that was really great. Thank you very much for that, because I'm going to have a four mission organization. So, but I thought, OK, I'm going to choose another moment that I realized was really, really key for me. And it was when I was a child. So let's see, 1979 is here. Let's put this here. Right? So I'm, I'm a child, and it's a summer day. And my mother says to me, Idola, which is my name, my first name, Idola, put on your shoes. We're going to go downtown. We're going to do something really important. Don't tell your father. So we go downtown. It's a beautiful summer day. We go down, if any of you have been in Washington, this is in Washington, D.C., you know, there's the, the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Memorial and the reflecting pool. And so we get down there. There are thousands of people around the reflecting pool. Mm -hmm. We find this little corner of the reflecting pool. Like, here's the Washington Monument. There's the Lincoln Monument. We find this little corner by the reflecting pool where we squeeze in, right? And it's like amazing. And there are these speakers, but there probably aren't enough because I don't think they thought there were there going to be that many people. And there are these speakers, you know, and they're talking in the sun, and everyone is in this state of ecstasy. And every once in a while, I hear, I, at first I thought that we were at, I didn't know, it wasn't happening, we were at some sort of interactive performance of Moses. <laughs> because I've heard a lot about freedom. And I thought, oh, are we in a play? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, is this, I said to my mother, is that Moses? And she sort of smiled, you know. And so every once in a while, there would be this wah, 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 wah coming out of the, I couldn't quite hear what it was. But the crowd would go crazy. And I thought, oh my god, I love this moment. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I realized was that my mother, for maybe the only time in her life, it felt like she was with people that she felt part of. My mother kind of looked like Anne Riffa. In fact, she was about a shade darker. And I realized this was the only time that she was surrounded by a lot of people, especially women, who looked like her. And she was related to them. And I thought, oh my god, she is with her community. I couldn't define it, but I knew that. And I felt it really, really strongly. And so that also moved me. And I thought, this is like theater. The set is great. It's dramatic. You have all these people. You have this. These, this, the, I can't hear everything, but it's obviously a great speaker with a great voice, you know. And then there was another wah, 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 and the crowd surged, and I fell into the reflective pool. <laughs> <laughs> and these women go, oh my god, oh my god, try, try, try. they pick me up, and they're holding me in the sun, and I'm going, oh my god. <laughs> so that, that was the moment. And as I look back on that moment through the lens of what we've been talking about, I mean, uh, it's really interesting. Years, years later, someone said to me, I said, well, that was your baptism, you know? And I went, oh my god, it was totally my baptism and what started everything. And now as I look at it to sort of articulate the context of what we've been talking about, it was the fanning of a collective flame. So I thought, okay, that's something I'm still interested in. It was an actualized, pivotal, transformative moment on time where there was a whole huge history that led to that moment, but Balanced with that history that led to that moment, there was also a future potential history, equally long, if not longer, that was different. And even at that, I was in elementary school, even then, 
I, I had a sense of that. And looking back at it now, I really have a sense of it. In terms of what, how it was art and aesthetics, I said it. Well, it had high aesthetics. It had a lot of the aesthetics that were found aesthetic aesthetics. They were the you know the resources that were around them. It was also another definition of art. I was saying earlier that art comes from the Norse art to be an art without art. Old English literally is being. Another one of the other definitions of art that come up is that it is finding the image, or when Plato talked about actually finding the form of art, finding the image uh, or, or the idea that triggers a, a sensory emotional moment. Um, and it also ties into culture and the cultivation. Cicero is probably the first one who said culture as we know it, where he said a cultura anime, which was the, the cultivation of the soul. But it's also the cultivation of a community, the cultivation of a person's, whether it's a soul as an entity, if you believe that, or whether it's, it's what they've said now, the mirror neurons in the brain, you know, which really operate in terms of like people relating and feeling empathy and getting motivated by, by, uh, by an artistic moment. But that was all there. All those types of things were present at that moment and in that day. There's also one thing in Occupy that we're really fighting for is the right to the commons, the right to the agora, that Greek, huge Greek space in the center of Athens that was the marketplace, that was where democracy really was forged. That was the theater before the separate theater got built. And I think a lot about agoraphobia in this society. Not only the agoraphobia about the fear of people participating in their society, in their democracy, but also the, the agoraphobia of the top that's afraid of of what comes. So that moment, uh, which was both a gift and also survival, because it was a moment of a gift of hope, but it was also a real clear indication that there was a long road ahead, and that there was going to be sacrifice, and that some people might not survive, but that the real survival of what this community was, what this way of thinking was, really crystallized at that moment. So August 1963, Washington, D.C., March on Washington, Martin Luther King, wah, 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 I have a dream. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so um, what we talked about was these pivotal moments and historical memory, historical trauma. You know, we talk about where it is in our bodies. And how do we make theater out of that? And how do we start this organic process? Because if I have a historical, we, we are learning this, it is in your body. And then from there becomes the historical memory. The historical memory of relocation, of abuse, of a cycle, but it is stored in your body. Do you get the pain? Do you get the color? Do you get the vision? And how do you do that? And how do you work with that? We see it in modern dance. We see it in these different techniques of organic storytelling, and that is the oral tradition, right? Um, because of weather, whether this was a bad time, we have generations and generations of storytellers. So part of that is comedy. And we never talk about comedy. Here we are in this room, and we all are very serious and we talk about that. But what is, you know, what is the pivotal role of my timeline? OK, I can think of a few things, because the one, is it when my mother beat up a bunch of gypsies? I don't know. <laughs> and then I said, no, I'm not going to do that one. And then I said, well, you know, is it the time when my family decided to occupy Washington, D.C. monument with over 30 Indians, and we all got kicked out, and they decided, and the police had to come, and we all had to hit the ground and roll over. And I said, you know, and then they made us change our shirts, shirt, because they didn't want snipers to shoot at us. And I said, no, I shouldn't talk about that. I'm saying, I'm really talking bad about my mom. So I shouldn't talk about that. And then I said, well, you know, what is the big uh, thing? And I, I was like, 1976, Spider-Woman Theater erupts in my living room. And it's the first time I heard, saw this, this um, theatrical way of sharing stories about abuse. And I was very young. I was seven years old. And I've used these techniques my entire life. But I said, no, let's go a little further. What, what, you know, that's history, right? What's happening now, right? So then there was Idol No More, which really woke up my senses to another generation who was attacking, uh, the Native communities were attacking something that really, that really felt that the youth, and I had to back up the youth, and I realized I wasn't youth anymore. <laughs> so that's the other one. So, but 
The one that really, and this is the one that really, when I knew my work as a theater artist was not done, was when Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson opened up at the, at the public theater. Mm. Now, <laughs> I at the time was working at the UN, right? So I'm hearing all this stuff. They have an initiative at the public theater. Everyone's saying, oh, you know, this is a terrible place. But I have no, because this day is the Doctrine of Discovery. Doctrine of Discovery is this big paper where basically Christians came, Pope came, said, we're not human, we'll take your land. So that's it. And so, and they threw us off. And so it's going to be this big apology at the UN. So I get my Prada suit on, right? And I'm putting my makeup on. So you got to have good Prada to go to UN. So you go to, I'm going to have get my in there. And I'm going in there. And I look at Good Day New York. And the star of Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson gets on. And he says, oh, this is play about Andrew Jackson. We made a musical about it. And it was like what double take. You're like, huh? So I, you know, like, and I love Lucy, like, huh, what? And so I was like, no, nah. right? It's like, nah. And then he starts to talk, and they said, well, you know, she says the, the other, it's like an idiot, an idiot, an idiot having a conversation, right? <laughs> so I'm here, and, I, and I'm like, okay, so the other idiot says, well, isn't there a lot of stuff with, you know, Andrew Jackson? And he says, in all of his glory, oh, no, that was propaganda. I said, oh, dear God, right? So I say, oh, well, isn't there a native initiative there? And I'm thinking, nah, so... He goes on, they show little fake Indians on stage, and I say, oh, God, I don't have time for this. So I get in the cab, I'm going there, and I get there, and the public theater decided to invite every elder at the UN who's fighting all day to do have some entertainment musical theater, so they had them see this play. They were crying in the aisles. They got up and they walked out. So I haven't seen this play, and I'm trying to be fair because I'm a fair person. It's a fair thing to do. So I go, <laughs> so I'm not going to say, they're going to say it's sour grapes, she didn't make this musical. I said, okay. So I go, <laughs> and I get a bunch of people together. I get my mother, I get a professor, I get a preacher. I know it sounds like a joke, right? A mother, a professor, mm -hmm. we'll go and see a musical theater play. Right? They walk into a wall. <laughs> so they come in, and we're all going, and these are buried as a diplomat there, and we're sitting there, and I'm looking at this play, and I get free tickets, and I go in because the elders all say, you have to see, you have to do something, you have to speak about it on the floor. I was like, you know, I mean, you know, okay, some musical theater isn't good, what do you want from my life? I can't make a, you know, a democratic thing about it. So I go, the music starts, something, wow, this is really a cool play. I said, oh God, I hope, you know, I hope it's good. And if it is good, I'm gonna be so jealous that a non-Indian wrote it, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna be so upset, right? So I'm watching and they're doing all those things that you're learning in theater. And I'm, and I'm thinking, oh my God, this might really be good. You know, maybe someone got it, right? And then the Indian joke started. And then the other Indian joke started. Then they did one little, two little Indians. And people think it's hilarious. And my historical trauma, not only mine, but everybody, my whole family was there. My husband, by the way, the coward that he is, he's the managing director, he stayed home. He said, I'm not going anywhere with you and your family seeing a play called Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson. Forget <laughs> it. So he stays home. So I go, I go there, and, it's the, and you see the historical trauma. And it just was like, it brought back so many memories. So many memories of being not called Dirty Indian, not good enough, being and I brought up all of, and I look over to my, I look over to the audience, all these India, and they're crying, and people are laughing, and then I got, then I said, okay, so then I got scared, because I said, wow, if you can make genocide funny like this, and make it nothing, when we're over at the other end of the UN fighting for our lives in the front line, this is really scary. I said, this is propaganda at, the, at its best, and I said, now I know what it feels like to be a Jew in Germany. I said, because there is no way, this is scary, they can attack us, and nobody will, nobody will do help us. So then the play's over, and of course, my mother can't help herself, she boos. And she goes, boo, hiss, right? And I'm up two, I'm two seats up. And her girlfriend's with her, her, her my, my, my stepmother, my, and they're with each other. And this guy stands up and frightened words to my family. He says, you're old, you're fat, and you're not funny. Oh, God. Fright breaks out. My mother jumped, you know, my mother's older now. She's 75. 
and she staggers up and she's gonna clock him. And her girlfriend grabs him and they're yelling at me. They're saying, Muriel, do something! So I'm trying to get down. And then they say, security, security, ushers, come. It, it was, and so, I, and then they close the door. So I decide to say, and I'm saying, and I have like these people trapped. And I'm saying, because I wanna say that we're normal because we're the only people of color in this whole damn place. And I'm saying, we're not crazy, okay? This is historical trauma. <laughs> and they're like stuck because they're stuck in this theater. And my mother, and they, they call the police, they're gonna escort my mother out. We go downstairs. Then this woman tried to tell, tell us, well, you know it's satire. And you shouldn't be upset about satire. You know, it's not really racist. So a guy from the audience comes over and says, I understand your racism and decides to debate with four Indians who are just angry and want to debate anybody because Indians can debate forever. And so then I felt like I was in the producers because then somebody turns around and says, let's kill the actors. And you're like, don't kill the actors, please. They just want a job. And it just escalated and they're all huddled. All the actors are huddled. They're afraid to go outside because the Indians took over this thing. And there's all not a bunch of us. It, it was really like the coach and, and <laughs> like we were going to, lack of a bit, scalp these people. And that's what they really thought. And I go over and the lead guy, the guy who was in vampire, Lincoln vampire, guy, and he says, and I look at him, he's like really upset. And I go and I shake all of their hand as a fellow actor, and I say, I understand, you know, this is a play, you're an actor, but this was a terrible play. And this is offensive, and I really hope it's a flop. You know, and I just want to let you know that, but I think you're extremely talented. And I was right. I said, I think you're extremely talented, and I think you're a great singer, but good night with you. And he looks, so we go outside, and my, now we're kicked out of public theater. Police are there. And I'm sitting, and he finally comes out, and he looks at me, and he shakes, and he has tears in his eyes. And he shakes my hand, and he says, thank you. And then my family goes after him, he's like, taxi! And he goes, and he sails off into the night. So I go home, right, and I tell my husband all of this. And he just looked at me, he says, wow, another night with the Miguels, eh? <laughs> so at that night, I just said, you know, I really believe that that was my pivotal role, that you could say, talk politics forever, you could talk, you know, write papers forever, you could do all of that stuff, but the point is, I, you know, I was in theater to make a change, and I knew this could never happen again. And that's when I started working with Nina, uh, Nina and Morgan, and really trying to make a protest piece, and we made a protest piece called Oops, Bloody Bloody Oops. And it brought up a lot of things about images, it brought, you know, a, 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 you know, Peter Pan, the Chugga Wugga Wug song, looking at things on television, and like empowering other um, urban kids when you're the only person of color in the room, like, what do you do? You have to fight, and you spend a lot of that time fighting, but how do we empower our youth? How do we empower them to do something creative with that? So, 2008, Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson is when really I knew that my, I had a political life, more of a political life, um, outside of political arena, but to the theater to create, other than standing naked in front of the gap and saying, you know, down with one foot Andrew Jackson. So, then everyone wants to come up now to talk about the other part? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, thank you for listening to some of our moments. Um, and so, we just wanted to give an opportunity for people to share with a partner, you know, their a moment. For obviously, there's like a big spectrum of like things that were, you know, like really, really obviously critical thing, you know, just think of something that you want to share with someone else. Um, and we'll give a couple minutes each side and we'll tell you when to switch. About five minutes top, we'll tell you when to switch and just turn to the person next to you.
things in in some type of historical context I mean one of an individual who's had a great political influence on my political development personal development Grace Lee Boggs <coughs> sort of was the person who sort of politically helped me understand the difference between insurrection and revolution and understanding revolution as evolution and growth as evolution and so we kind of want to put this in like a historical chronology um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask everyone to come up and um, this down here being like present day, right now, well, I don't know what the date is, but whatever the date is, 2013, today, August, July, uh, is right here. And then uh, down there is Nellie Bly, and I don't know if anyone's that old, but you know, um, 1880, but you know. <laughs> um, we're going to ask you to stand in chronology, and a little bit of negotiation too, check in with your, your neighbor, see where folks are. Uh, Morgan, Morgan is here in 1963. So, and uh, we're over here down here in 2009. Tuesday on the cover of the New York Times there was an article about a man in Louisiana we all revere named John Barry. He wrote this book Rising Tide and uh, he started working for the oil companies about six months ago and everybody in Louisiana wrote him off and I said man he's not a traitor this guy's an infiltrator I promise you and sure enough he came out of that experience in six months and he has led with the Orleans Parish Redevelopment Authority the flood protection zone they sued 100 oil companies for 150 years of damage to the wetlands and have found the loophole in the law that the companies actually signed in a contract that said anything we do to damage we'll, we'll repair and and so it was just this moment of watching somebody that you really respect kind of getting accused by the public and then noticing that he put his integrity on the line mm -hmm. and his job on the line and so he came out of that and he does not have a job anymore and his integrity is still in question but now there's a suit against 100 oil companies so it's just a really nice one. Let's go down to the opposite end. Oh, what's up, Mike? So, May, May West, learning, I must have been in, I must have been in high school, um, and seeing a May West movie on TV, and then 
being like, who is this woman? And finding out that at the same time that she was on, she was doing these wonderful, wild performances that became very important to my aesthetic. Um, she was put in jail, and that she would sit in, and she was in jail, I think she was in jail a bunch, but the image that always came to me was on Roosevelt Island. That old dilapidated building used to be a, an, an insane asylum, and at one point she was put in there, and she would knit in her partner's <laughs> People would come in and, and visit her, and she'd be knitting in this horrible place, and just the contrast between those two things. So that's 18, I think it's 89. Yeah. Right, right. I guess in the interest of uh, our live stream videographers, we'll just kind of move down the, the, the line here a little bit. If we somewhere around the 64 mark, be around where Morgan is, if y'all to the left or right want to share anything. Okay, this is probably 1944, and I was with my grandmother, who is a designer, and she put some flowers and fabric and all kinds of things in front of me and she said anything you dream you can make with your hands let's move, move down here to uh, I don't know what year this is around uh, 86 86 yeah someone who owns that year why not so I, I'm on my knees in uh, in in Berlin. I'm speaking French. It taken me like a, a half an hour to get the nerve up to come in this room because there was one woman sitting in the room. She was sitting on a chair. I was sitting next to her on my knees. Her name is Ariane Mushkin, and I I didn't know why I was there, but I knew I had a question. And uh, I, it finally came to me. She was very nice, this babbering person. And I finally said, what about this company thing? And she looked at me sternly and she said, well, what are you going to do without a company? I mean, don't get me wrong. They make you miserable. They're always leaving. There's always a problem. But what are you going to do? And I had an epiphany in that moment where I realized that every great production of, of, of a theater or dance I'd ever seen was always by a company. And that was turning for me. We moved down into the 90s. Anyone in the 90s? 2000? One last final. Anyone have any burning mm -hmm. moment they'd like to share? I can, I can give it a shot. Yeah. Um, in 99, uh, NATO started bombing Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time having been an anti-war activist and grown up during the time of the Vietnam War, all these people I knew were for it. I'd never known so many people who were for military action. Um, so I started having people over to my house in small groups and asking them questions and sharing stories to try to understand. And the woman who was the editor of the country's um, largest anti-Vietnam War rag, I knew her, she came and said a reminder of the Holocaust, the fellow who won an arts program for a major bank in New York came and said Melissa was reminded of his dad and his dad was a bully. And, I know it could be easy to laugh, but these were very, very intense conversations. And I was asking people, what does it remind you of? Why would you be it? What do you think? And so I gathered hundreds of emails from um, people who were involved in articles and journal entries, kind of started to meet that community from all the countries there, and did a play and asked 35 friends, including my mailman and my brother. And we did a one-night performance, um, Rodney McCauley, at St. Peter's Church, where they read as themselves these texts from there to try to understand it. And the next day I flew there to interview men who had committed these acts and made two trips and interviewed scores of men uh, who had done and participated in terrible things for the next year and a half. And in my heart wrote a play oh, called Just War, but I haven't written it on paper yet. And that's when I decided to be an artist and do nothing else. Mm. Wow. Cool. Thank you, Marty. That's like a perfect transition. Um, so we have found ourselves on this calendar together. Um, and we've made the calendar with our bodies. And today we find ourselves actually also, probably for the first time in this configuration, in the same geography. 
And we want to take this moment to now uh, recognize, I think uh, Morgan got to it a little bit where she talked about being there um, that day in Washington and, and kind of reading that history back that led to that moment. Um, that's a little bit of what we've just done. We want to take some time now with the time we have left to actually now together, that we're all here together, to start to create that calendar into the future. Because there are some trajectories that we're on in this geography and the geography of the US that are uh, pretty readable, anticipatable, and so it seems like we could uh, do something together right now, make some things together, or just imagine some things together uh, that may bear fruit. So we came up with a few scenarios that are sitting on that calendar way over there. They're sitting out ahead. Uh, but we think they're probably going to happen, unfortunately. But fortunately, we're all here together. And we, and we have some ideas and some creativity. Uh, Lenina, do you want to share our sure. scenarios? Yes. And what we're going to do is, there's six of us, so two of us from this team will go with each group. And there will be three groups. And these teams will create a response to the scenario. And there's also an option for another uh, you know, imperative, necessary scenario, right? In case sure. don't, yeah, that's true. Um, so, so I think that when you hear these scenarios, they're not going to be something super uncommon because a lot of what happens, like history repeats itself. So these are narratives that um, have repeated themselves. And that's one of the discussions that we had uh, as we were coming up with them. Um, so the first scenario, and this kind of came out of some of the discussions this morning, is going to be dealing with issues of gentrification and development um, and displacement. So you're in a community, and a developer would like to destroy the last remaining affordable housing unit that is housing about 400 families in the community. Um, immigrant families within this housing unit are actively being targeted um, to, to be evicted from their homes um, as the developer is still in, negotiating and trying to figure out how to demolish this property so that luxury condos, office space can be built. So that's the first scenario. Um, scenario number two, there is a major hurricane and this hurricane has now come and destroyed an entire community, uh, its housing, its businesses, its infrastructure. There's lots of people who are displaced. There are a lot of families that are divided and can't find each other. Um, what are we gonna do to build it back? Scenario number three. There's a young black man uh, who's also queer, and he's in a neighborhood that you know he hasn't always been in, and he meets a group um, of, of, of youth like himself, um, white youth who beat him up um, and kill him. And in the court case, it's seen as self-defense uh, because this person shouldn't have been in that neighborhood. So how does the community respond to that? The one thing I'll add is that in the, yes. in the interest of the urgency of the drama, um, you live in that housing development that's under threat. Mm -hmm. It is your community where the hurricane has occurred. This, is, this young man is, is your friend, daughter, son, cousin. So it could come. It can come to you any way, any form. You know, all of us are going to facilitate different ways to do this, and we're all going to go into groups. Um, mine is going to basically be about historical memory and where that lays on your body with something asking the question and seeing where we go from there. Who's that? Been? And everyone has a different way of approaching it. Yeah, Lenina and I will take a group, and I think we'll be really open to whatever process we come up with in there. Yeah. You're gonna go with me. Yeah. And then the third group is uh, Michael and Rachel. 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 Should we name the groups? And we're just gonna count off in threes and assign you, so you don't have to do any of that cogitating of who you want to be with and what scenario you want. The scenario uh, is imposed upon you. It's not usually one you get to choose. 
Um, so who is our first participant on this end? Well, Rachel's facilitating, so. One. Two. Three. 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 Anyone else joining us? One. Fantastic. Two. Three. Yes. Great. Uh, ones go with Morgan and Muriel. Twos will go with Lenina and I. And threes will go with uh, Michael and Rachel. And the scenarios are? So, so we'll hand the scenarios. <coughs> uh, All right. All right. We have 20 minutes to respond. <laughs> You know, something that's bigger than even just. Well, then, like, I'd, I'd say, like, a, a point if it's just, uh, it's just us dealing with it for now. I mean, well, we're just a collectivity okay, sure. amongst. Well, then I'd, I'd say it'd be to, like, to create okay. other, uh, to delegate, like, uh, areas, like, specific, like, like, or a specific neighborhood or, or specific, like, so to, like, organize, like, tasks based on uh, uh, ability. What might this task be? We're just going to work one with them and see what's... You know what? What structures are sound to yeah. canvas, canvas the area? Yeah, okay, and then, you can I mean, talk to people like like uh, Clyde was saying, but also there are people probably already organizing. So try to contact them, whatever you know, however you can. Probably there's no phone, there's no electricity, so what re yeah. What resources are where and who has right. them, and how do we help distribute yeah. them? If, if there is water, are there are there boats, mini boats that you can use to go around or? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know who's on the top roofs okay. to see each other and who, who needs rescue immediately. 
you know what's more urgent probably work in, in couples because it's such a dangerous situation find out what uh, communication tools are out there that work still work I mean I think this the response is also like a creative like a, impression in the and I had to really think about that. Why am I angry now? You know, uh, uh, someone was abused 20 years ago. The guy said, well, why, why now? So if we think about that, why now? And if we put yourself to think about it for a few minutes and think about that scenario, someone's developing to take it. Whatever it is, there's no right or wrong here, but think about whatever it is. And then we'll go in a circle of why now? Okay, so let's take that three, uh, you know, three minutes. Okay. Okay, let's just go. Yeah, let's just go. Why now? Why would you be angry about that now? Why now? Oh, because it's a, it's it's a problem that has escalated <laughs> to the point. Of, um, oh, okay. Sad. Uh, oh, furious. Furious. Good. Why now? Does it make you angry? Sad. My heart feels hollow. Well, then that's good. Okay, be a little more specific. Is it painful? Is it is it sadness? Yeah, sadness. Sadness. And remember, sadness. Good. Why now? Uh, agitation. Agitation. Agitation and anger. Agitation in fury. Naive agitation. Naive. Pick one word. Mm. One. Just give me one. Mm. A word. Um, um, no, I can't. No, just give me a word. Why not? That's good. Fearful. You know, Fearful. Overwhelmed. Funny, you Disguise. know, stop being funny. Good. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, that was what I was just, say. Uh, <laughs> you know, just uh, occupy our time in a productive way. Right, yeah, like what we realized is that, like, there were, uh, that there were, like, dance parties that were happening. Yeah, I would think there were dance parties that were happening. You know, the white queer we weren't as public, regardless. We're organizing a much here now. What are other equivalencies of that? You know, it's like okay, so that's one example. You know, like dance parties, like in the queer community. Okay, that can like cross boundaries. You know, like what, what about other... what about the isolation? I see these as being like there's this there's a one point, and it's just sort of a floating point, which is like this the beauty you know sort of there's sort of a beauty beautiful freedom of that floating, and it's like is that space like how I don't know how to express or how how that space is like. That's the, the action against that is like is the, is like taking away that sort of this sort of beauty or this sort of that space, and I don't know how to address that at all. But I mean, just the to me, it's like that's almost like a dramaturge of just this sort of like this is the action, you know. And then there's this group, which is like how do you communicate with this group, you know, the, uh, I, I, as to the idea of this individual floating through that sphere, basically. I don't know. What it made me think of, um, I, I, I'm a teaching artist in, in a lot of inner city or whatever places in Brooklyn, and um, so in Brownsville, and, uh, we have many, five minutes. many times I've been kind of like accosted <laughs> by like a lot of aggressive energy, like literally I'm in the in front of the school and like kids are like just so aggressive in teaching, it's all about this aggressive thing, and I've learned that it's like, they need this. This is actually, it's, it's a tool for them to have the strength because their community is very tough and very hard. And so it's not like you can't be this way. Like this is not okay behavior. It's not like that. But to say that there's another way, that there's other options and give them some other things. And I think that, um, that there is this aggressive thing that, you know, there's this whole group and this is like out of fear or whatever. They have this aggressive thing that happens. And, um, 
and to just cut that off might hurt them in their communities you know what I mean like in the project it's like it's it's tough you know and you can't just be a wimp in some ways but also you can't kill people and, you know what I mean but I just think that that's also an important conversation it's not like I mean, in, in winter it's hard because, you know, it's, it's a crisis. One of the things that happen is that people panic. So you need to grab those tools because somehow what you need to try is, is to work with the panic. Um, you know, like that ca kayak anecdote that, that Molly Smith, you know, you cannot lean outwards, you need to lean inwards and go with the people in into the panic and then try to use it. Like somehow you, you, you take advantage of your storytelling or whatever it is, charisma, and try to manage that moment because one of the things crucial at that time right is to get everybody out of panic and you need to navigate those hours which you know they're eternal sometimes they last forever but it's like you know we're gonna get the help we're gonna be okay but we need to do this now so and there's no doubt that we need to do it so let's not panic do you have a specific activity and then she's no that she's doing she's gonna do okay go 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 tell your story Tell your story, Morgan. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. okay, okay. To them, not to, the, to them. All right. <laughs> uh, we are pushing it, you know, the exaggeration I, I, I by, by softening the edges of things and retelling what's going on. I've had my for and years. there's always a need you know, to predict what's going to happen but next. This is something like, different. Do you, do you this is like being invaded, like that, that sci-fi movie where they came and, and they were like locusts and, and just so ate everything. That, that because there's a time limit on this. I feel at the same time I think there's a shift. But these story, people are doing it while they still so can. They're doing it through the banks, they're doing it through student loans, they're doing it through us. It's also, it's greed, but it's okay. also racism. One minute, how are you going to share back? I one minute. So I want someone to come up, take one movement and go. But you could just do one thing and continue to do it. And say say the word. I feel powerless. I feel infantryated. Do it four times. Okay, Nina, go. Keep on going. Keep on going. Aiming at all parties, and we try like do, do, do folks feel like they want, we want to try to bring a lot of different parties together, or do something that works with the community that um, George Zimmerman is from, or like you know, or the black community, or the queer community. Or, like, or who, who is the audience? For right, and whose stage is that? Like, is that the stage of the observers, or is that the yeah, stage yeah. of the participants? Like, what is their stage? That was their stage because that's where the action took place. You know what I mean? That shifting place. What if you divided up by community, people selected how they wanted to be, a, a reenactment of the trial in some way, or the event? Tell your story. Tell your story.
want to share with the other two groups? Um, we can pull back into this space so that we can best uh, connect with the um, live stream. This is uh, audience space, this is presentational space. <laughs> this is audience space. This is presentation space. <laughs> Will I block you, sir? Sure. Yeah. You're going to be good. You're going to be able to say what you Scenario one. Oh, is that us? Oh, yeah, that's us. Okay. Okay. Muriel. Morgan, so everybody who's Nicole. in scenario one? Yes. We have three minutes to share back. Yes. I mean, that's okay. enough. So this won't take very long. We just, what we did was we started doing story weaving and talking about developing. We did some warm up, and then we took a story, and then from there, one person takes that movie <coughs> to show the frustration. Our scenario was what? Uh, the scenario was, a developer wants to destroy the last remaining affordable housing unit that houses 400 families. Immigrant families are being actively targeted for deportation as a developer. In a so we're taking one story and we're weaving it and pulling it apart and I'll call everybody up one by one when we go with the movement. So tell your story. <laughs> but I've been here for 30 years. I mean, I've seen these things come before, but this one feels different. This one feels like an invasion. This one feels like that science fiction movie where like, you know, those beings that look like insects are gonna come and they're like locusts and they're just gonna wipe everything out because their time is limited. Because somehow they know that they're gonna die. Their planet is gonna go away and they're gonna die and their time is limited. And this is what it feels like. It feels like somehow these people, people are around and they're just gonna raid everything they can. And they're just gonna get rid of everybody that they all the way. It's away because they all the way. It's that took place in a couple different time periods. The first time period was uh, the waters have just receded. It's that first moment of quiet. Uh, and then we sort of had some discovery from there. So what are, some of the, what are some of the things that we're doing in that first moment? We're canvassing what's going on immediately around us in our community based on our needs and what's available for resources. That's step one. I'm compiling a list of skills that we have that are actually useful in a crisis situation. Um, so like actually, if someone knows first aid or someone knows, you know, like that. We're going in groups of two because it's a dangerous situation. Yeah. 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 And gathering people to safe places that are building but are not going to crash in. Yeah, and then just assessing what's what's working, what we can use as communication tools, which would help the, the needs and what the skills are. So there's sort of this um, identification as just another citizen, or non-citizen as it were. And then 
looking at that liminal moment where we're all under the tent now, we're dry, we have water, some access to food, tipping over into the citizen artist. And in that moment, uh, we sought to discover what might we have to offer in that moment. Ollie? In that moment, we might have to offer uh, up producing capabilities, like uh, how to make um, <coughs> make more with less. So we, you know, we'd be put, we'd try to put ourselves in the mode of like we're in a, um, you know, this is a production with minimal resources. And what is the what's the show and what what contribution can we make and what do we have our access? So. Hmm. Susan, you had a good one. Well, I'm going to gather all the children. And we don't have pencils, we don't have paper, we don't have crayons, we don't have anything for set design. We have no musical instruments, but we are going to create poetry and songs, and we're going to do some improv, um, and we're going to do some dance. I'm a comedian, so I'm going to start telling jokes. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm also going to document. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel that's what I'm going to do. Nothing yeah. brings up morale. That's what I'm going to do. Documentation. Comedy is all documented. And I suggested working with shadow puppets, since there's probably like. Right. No evaluators. No. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think that RJ was just, at one point, we were kind of like going a little bit back and forth about not being so egocentric or thinking that our role, particularly as artists, is so important in this moment. Um, because I think we were talking a lot immediately about like survival, like, oh God, we got to get boxes, we got to get water, we got to get, you know, and, and, and we were like, well, okay, but then like, uh, what, what kind of response are we giving as artists? Like once things are a little bit more settled and we know that certain things are in place, like how can we come to it from that direction um, and then you know we were so we, so we didn't have a whole lot of time to develop that because we were still so in like survival mode right um, but that but so what did come out was like these, these ideas of like you know that you can just work immediately with children right there in that moment or you can you know do a, like a shadow theater because you don't need any particular all you need is light you don't need any particular props so um, that could be something and, like something I didn't say that I was thinking about was like you know one thing I remember doing was like making a lot of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, you know, like like putting smiley faces on them, you know, with like a marker in, a, in you know, while you're putting it in a paper bag. Like those little things, like a, add an element of beauty or spirituality or creativity to an ordinary task. Um, so it's kind of like Yay! Yay! I'll go up there. Yeah, Come on, everybody. Yeah, come on, group three. Come on, sorry. Oh. Do you want to remind people of our scenarios? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Somebody's thinking. Um, our, our scenario is, uh, you know, quote unquote, modern day lynching of a young black queer uh, individual by other young people, other peers um, of an opposite or of a different uh, racial demographic. In our response, it well, was also in that it was a trial and they were found not guilty. Yes, yes. yes. Sorry, read the whole thing. Yes. <laughs> yes. And they were, they were, they were. He was found not guilty because of self defense for reasons of self defense. And so what we what we thought about is um, is the way that we thought about Trayvon Martin case and how it was um, publicly. You know, it was it was a very public uh, process. And the, the, the judicial process was open for the world to kind of look at it and see it as it was progressing on so we could give live commentary as it was happening. And that what, it, what would it look like for us to stage um, a concurrent uh, um, alternative uh, reckoning system uh, in which we, we try the case in a public forum, not like you know pundits talking, but actually set it up in a way in which the case is argued from um, or, or presented from those various sides and, and have that as a space in which we um, move concurrently with the, the cases is developing in the in the in the judicial system, but in a public sphere, uh, in which we're kind of reenacting and, and, and bringing it back to, um, as as Michael was saying, open up more channels of conversation that are, are a little more nuanced and and don't really make their way into the, the public court system. Mm -hmm. We um we talked about uh, 
sort of the why in trying to understand as artists in the context of this circumstance and systems that lead to this situation and the, and the conditions around it? Is our goal, thinking about the word activism, is our goal to make dialogues between people who self-define as others in relation to these issues? Is our goal to do something that is more traditionally activist in terms of make change in the system and actually get involved in advocacy in a variety of aggressive or passive ways uh, and just trying to sort of pull apart what the responsibilities slash needs were in relation to the different artists who might come together around this, which led us to a conversation about. Um, or to a third possible goal, it being um, envisioning and embodying an alternative to the criminal justice system. Like what would our system of holding each other, each other accountable for the ways we hurt each other and um, yeah, hurt each other ultimately. How, how are we gonna hold each other accountable and, and create uh, systems of reconciliation and justice um, that are different? So yeah, that's where we landed. So we built that and we have flyers for everyone later. Oh, is this Friday? Awesome. <laughs> is that they all kind of go through a different window in the basement to the experience. Uh, like, like Muriel very much was about, let's get this in the body, the actual emotional experience that people are feeling, let's deal with that first. And we went around and people have different things, a lot of people were angry, sorrow, whatever. We kind of went with overwhelmed because mm -hmm. that's paralysis. And paralysis is like somebody sitting down on, on other things. Like I really wanted to, well, who, who, who has said opportunity? Is that you? I really, <laughs> I really wanted great. to get, because I thought, oh, this is the scene. The person who feels overwhelmed is going to meet the person who goes, oh, this whole, you know, repay is opportunity. It's like, well, you come from a different perspective than I do. And would also that, that it would be allow the person who just feels powerless and overwhelmed to actually maybe get angry or whatever yeah. or to motivate. But the whole idea is that to actualize so you physically feel it. So you it feel that trauma. You so you know what the trauma is. You know where it's coming from. So this could be used in two ways, this technique. First of all, to develop a piece that you want to put in public view, to talk about, to be a protest piece. It can go from one grain, one story. And then you start to develop it. You know, you don't have to have a script. You can have it on the body. Now, you can also go into communities with the same thing. And you can talk about, and, and, and you know, we're to be stricter with youth, and we talk about violence against women, and rape. A lot of times I do a lot of stories like this, a whole day of suicide stories. So who knew, who knew a suicide? You know, on the reservations in our communities, a lot of suicide. So what, what has saved you? You know, then it gets so heavy, you bring them out of it, let's do grandmother stories. What has brought you back to the spiritual content? So this is how you could use the first part in showing it as a protest piece or using it in your communities. Yeah, we have about, this is about our time for the day, but before we close, I just want to invite any, any, any like lingering questions, thoughts, reactions? Appreciations. Appreciations, however you want to phrase that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. You would. Hard enough, people. Awesome. I'm not sure what's up next. <laughs> up next, I just want to say thank you. I want to introduce Michael Road, who's here. Got stuck in some travel. Mashugana, Sojourn Theater, Northwestern. Welcome, Michael. Winter. Winter Miller, who, who came from, who's, who's up in the region. Winter is a creator of a piece called In Darfur, which uh, some of you may have heard of and joined us for. Uh, so there's going to be a break now uh, until 4 o'clock. It's about 20 of. Um, we'll meet back in the pavilion. The next part is um, a brief talk with these co-authors, uh, Nancy Abrams and Joel um, Primack. Sorry, uh, their book uh, I believe is on the table in there. I sent a link to some of their work. There's a short TEDx talk. You can look at that in the break or not, um, and there'll be a short talk with them about their work and how it relates to this context. So four o'clock in the pavilion will be next. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.